Small example, another example, very old example. We measure gravitational constant G. Different materials were used and the following observations were obtained. Five different measurements for five different sets of materials for gold, five for platinum, five for glass. And the question we could raise maybe is, is it the same, this constant for those materials, or is it not? So we could test the hypothesis that they are the same versus it's not. We could plot it like this. What is your gut feeling looking at the numbers? Are they statistically different, the three group means? What do you find? What you should look at are the means, and then we should look at the variabilities. And then, of course, we should remember that this variability is sort of, you could say it's being killed or it's being diminished by a factor of five because we have five in each group. The more we have in each group, the easier it becomes to actually prove that groups are different. The, the uh, sigma squared times divided by n becomes smaller and smaller the larger the n in each group. So, so if, with higher and higher n, smaller and smaller group differences could be detected. Are these three groups statistically different, you find? I think so, actually. Having groups that are even as different as being completely separated, they don't even overlap in their individual measurements they will be different, I'm sure. Um, let's see about it. The, so the, uh, the exercise could be maybe set up a model. Well, the model is the one I've shown you. That would be that part, if we really want to spell it out, everything. and test if there is a difference. That is, we test the hypothesis of no difference as the null and a difference as the alternative. By the way, when we have more than two groups, there is nothing to think about related to the one-tailed and two-tailed challenge that we have discussed so much in all those cases of only one and two groups in play. Since with more than two groups, for instance, three groups, there is not a meaningful uh, sort of one-way one -way thing we can do, or one-tailed uh, uh, hypothesis test. So a multi-sided test like this, as we could also call it, is always non-directional, or it is not one-tailed. It, it's meaningless to call it two-tailed, of course, because we have three different things going on. So there are basically the thing is, there is, if you didn't think about it, fine. You don't have to think about it. There's nothing to think about there. There's only one way of doing it. So, if we were given, and here all the, all the tedious comp computations have been uh, given to us already, um, we have the sum of squares for, we could call this, uh, this is SSTR. Often there is a name for it. It's the material groups that we are looking at. And then we have the SSE. What about the degrees of freedom? That's for us to fill out. How many degrees of freedom for the material sum of squares, SSTR in this case? The K minus one number is what I'm asking you. What is K minus one? Two. There you go. What is the degrees of freedom for the sums of squares of arrows, or the error degrees of freedom sometimes calling it? Yeah, if you look back on the slides, that was capital N minus K, that is the number of observations minus the number of groups, or differently said, the number of observations minus one within each group added up across the groups. No, not quite. Nine, not quite. Twelve, there you go. <laughs> Good. Fifteen observations, five, 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 minus three groups, right? Yeah, there were, f there were actually four, five in each group. I, uh, you have to remember that. Fair enough. 
12. So we take this six point something, we take this number, divide by two to get the mean square, that will then be 3.0527, still a small number. We take this 9.5 divided by 12, that then becomes 7.933 times 10 to minus 6. We compute the F test, which is those two numbers divided by each other. So this number is 3.0527 to 10, 10 to the minus 4, divided by 7.933 times 10 to the minus 6. If we take those two numbers, divide by each other, we get the number 38.479. Actually, we should put in the p-value column also. Let's find the p-value. Which f distribution should we use? We should use the one coming from the degrees of freedom. We've just found the 2.12 f distribution. Let's look at the f distribution in page the 6b here, the, the 1, that's the one that gives the 1% 1 1 critical values of the f. What was the numerator? That was 2. What about the denominator? That was 12. 6.93, the critical, the 1% critical value. So I don't even have to look at the 5%, that will be slightly smaller. The 1% critical value is 6.93. So, we could say F 0.01 was 6.93. That's the one I just looked up in the table. Have we proved that these average Gs are different across the three materials? Yes, we have, because the observed F is much larger than the critical F. That was the critical value way of finishing off the story. And the only thing we can say on the p-value is that the p-value is below 1%. That is as much as we can do with the tables of the book. Say the p-value is below 1%. For most practical purposes, that is fine. Let us jump to R to do it more exactly. Let me say, I could start out by doing two point twelve to find the critical value of ninety five percent. That was three point eighty eight. What about the critical value corresponding to one percent? That is ninety nine. That was the three six point nine three that I just saw on the table. So these are the tabulated values. How about p value? Well, that's, let's see what is the probability of going beyond 38.48 here. And then I forgot the degrees of freedom. This p-value is very low, right? 6.0 times t, 10 to the minus 6, very small p-value. We have proven with very, very high certainty that these average Gs are different for the three materials, right? That was how to do the hypothesis test in practice. So the p-value was actually, you could say, the p-value was actually 6.02, 10 to the minus 6, a very small p-value. So, conclusion, materials materials are different, right? We reject the null hypothesis of them being the same because we have seen a too unlikely 
difference between the three averages. So they must generically be different. We reject the null, we have to go for the alternative that they're different. That was the first part of this.